Well, we started out Redbird at, at a, a desk in my office. We spent about a year trying to solve for some of the problems that we saw with these really expensive simulators. It was kind of one of these things. We, we had this notion that a, a simulator that had very poor visuals and, and yet cost $10 million was, was really unnecessary. And so we started with the notion that given the state of the tech off the shelf technology, we could do this much better at a tiny fraction of the cost. So it was one of those intellectual exercises you do every once in a while just to prove that you can do it. This was in 2005, a couple of years later, we've got a Bondo and a Masonite prototype that we decided to take to Oshkosh. Not to sell it, but to see if anybody thought it was a good idea. We came back with so many pre-orders for that simulator that we had a panic attack when we got home and found out, oh my God, now we gotta actually build these things. So we were over those years in this workshop solving for things like wraparound visuals and motion, which of course was huge. The ability to easily swap out to different airplanes and solving for all the problems. But all within the context of the price point we were looking at, because with all of the products that we bring to market, we start with the price and we work backward from there. We know that a product has a value at a certain price, a real tangible high payback value at this price. And then the exercise is, okay, how do we build it for that much money and not lose our shirts doing it? You know? The result is we've created a new market that wasn't there before, and uh, that's where Redbird came from, and that's where we stay. You know, there's, there's always that raging argument about, since there's such a big difference between our price point and the next guy, should we take our prices up? And the answer is no, we won't. You know? The Skyport was the child of the notion that we needed to be able to prove the data we were collecting anecdotally, and that, that's what was behind it. It turned into something much bigger, but often these kind of ideas do. We got very lucky. We got some industry partners behind this that really thought this was a big idea. AOPA, Cessna, Gamma, Avemco Insurance Company, and King Schools primarily. And the result is, is we got all these really smart heads behind this idea and we put this together. And we really started with the idea about a year and a half ago. When we broke ground on this effort, which was only 20 weeks ago, we had this date in mind. Because even the building of the building, even the processes that we used to get it up fast and get it up inexpensively so that it could be replicated was part of the experiment. It turns out that it took us 20 weeks, but we think we can do it three weeks faster than that <laughs> on the next one, you know? And uh, we think we can spend a quarter million dollars less money. So it, we, we, that was, we had a quarter million dollars worth of mistakes and three weeks worth of mistakes on this, uh, on this first uh, effort. The DFC-90 all-digital attitude-based autopilot delivers significant performance and safety improvements over previous generation systems. Its innovative flight envelope protection guards against autopilot-induced stalls, and the straight and level mode provides one-button recovery from unusual attitudes for an added measure of safety. Immensely popular within the Cirrus community, the DFC-90 is now being made available for a growing list of aircraft including Piper Matrix and Mirage, Cessna 182s, and Beach Bonanzas and Barons. Fly with confidence. Fly with DFC-90. Part of the experiment was, you know, can you hit, hit this particular budget? Because again, we work back from what's, what kind of return do we need? In the case of this building, this was a 27,000 square foot building with all kinds of facilities and everything else. It cost us two and a half million dollars to build. So it was unbelievably inexpensive because of the way it was done, the speed it was done, and how we used pre-engineered designs. We spent half again that much on the four Cessna Skyhawks that we added to this thing. So all in all, we're going to be about $5 million out to start this project. One of the things we learned about when we built this building is no matter how much time you allow the contractor to spend building your building, if you give him two years, he's still going to be painting the walls the week before you open. It doesn't matter how much time you give him. So the lesson here was that we can significantly reduce the cost of these buildings by operating on very short timelines because there are so much fixed cost, so much embedded cost in waiting for a building to be complete that you burn a whole lot of money that you don't need to burn. So part of this experiment was to see if we could build a building this fast, and we did. And I think we can do it even better, but it requires you play a few tricks like putting together pre-engineered buildings in configurations to make them look like one building, those kinds of things. And leaving open designs like you see here that allow you to change the layouts really fast so that you can try a whole lot of different things. 
One of the surprises I found was, and it may speak to kind of the team and the people associated with this, is there was never a time when anybody inside Redbird or anybody associated with Redbird as a partner or anything else like that told us they didn't think we could get it done. The only people that ever told us they didn't think we could get it done were people outside the company. And I think that that, had anybody inside Redbird said that, number one, I would have been very surprised to hear that from them, but number two, we might not have made it. So attitude's a lot of this. This individual unit itself, as a standalone business, would not, is not gonna be a profit center for us. Our profits are in what we learn. As we continue to try to create daylight between us and our competitors, this is how we do this. Now, I should say that because of the relationship we've got with our other partners like Cessna and King Schools, the promise that we made to everyone is everything that we find, everything that we learn is public information. And we will play it back to the industry because I have this belief that someone will take our work and do better with it than we will just because a new set of eyes always works really well. So everybody, even our competitors, will have access to the, what we find here and how, we, how things are done and, and what these things mean. I'd love to convince some of our competitors that don't have motion that motion is as valuable as we think it is in, in flight training. So. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. I have a, a, a sack full of complaints about the way things are being done uh, with flight training, and they run to every, every corner of this particular industry. One of the things I, I feel is very unfortunate about what's happening in flight training is the cost that flight schools incur just trying to deliver a lesson. $300,000 Skyhawks, very expensive insurance, and high regulation and high security, and you know, all of the forces seem to line up against flight schools. And if we can understand this and begin to play this back to the industry, we think we can move the industry in the right direction to create a special class for flight training and get, get behind it. The avionics companies charge simulator makers exactly the same amount for their devices as they do the manufacturers, and yet they depend on the trainers to teach people how to use their avionics. Well, how about a discount? How about a special class for training pilots to safely use their equipment? On the other hand, I think that the, 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 given the pressures on the market, the day, days of flight schools that don't answer the phone when you call are numbered. I, uh, I have some experience with that, and I will tell you that you can call an awful lot of flight schools and nobody picks up the phone. And those days are going to be are over with because there are different expectations for levels of service for everything because everything is part of the flight experience and we need to understand all of these things. If you go over to the FBO as an example, you won't find a counter over there. There's no counter. Because a counter represents a barrier between the employees of the FBO and the customer coming in. If you've been in any FBOs, you know that sometimes the barrier is used to ignore the customers that have walked up to, you know, to buy some gas or something like that. So we're experimenting with everything. We're experimenting with how people move through buildings, how our employees interact, with customers on a more one-to-one -one basis. We need to understand food service and how it's used when uh, managing airplanes, you know, servicing airplanes, those kind of things. Everything that happens in the, in the Skyport is gonna be tracked. When you walk through the door as a student, we're gonna know where you are in the building all the time and what you're doing and what you're buying. So for instance, where a student might pay a fixed fee for a a pilot's license, that's not all they're actually spending with us. We know that they're buying food, they're buying supplies, they're, they're doing these things, and all of these things that we need to understand how much time they're spending practicing on the simulators, all has to be tracked. But if we don't have all of these services in this building, we're never going to figure out how to optimize it. Let's take the FBO as an example. When an airplane comes back in from a lesson, the worst thing that happens is it sits and it doesn't get used for another lesson for a while. Well. The role of the FBO is when the airplane comes in, it gets wiped down and it gets fueled right away with exactly the right amount of fuel and it's ready to go on the next lesson. And there's no lag time and there's no slowdown. And understanding the value of being able to manage that asset within the larger context of this facility 
is not something we could have done or measured if we had to depend on a different FBO to actually come and fuel our planes. I mean, how many times have you been on a flight lesson and you stand out on the tarmac for 10 minutes waiting for the fuel truck to come by? I mean, that's not the kind of experiment we want to do here. I don't like the notion of we're going to change the world here. I don't think we will. But somebody's got to start. And hopefully somebody will come along and do it even better than we do it. You need to stop looking at simulators as something the FAA will give you credit for and start looking at them as things that your customers will start to give you credit for in terms of the training time and their confidence and their willingness to buy an airplane when the whole thing is over with. So that's the challenge for us and it is to change the way flight schools think and change the way a flight training is done. And you know when you think about it, we're really not breaking any new ground. What we're doing is we're taking the, the fundamentals of air, airline pilot training down to the GA level and saying simulators are the way to go. They're safe. They, they, we can do things in them you can't do in other places. We can do special things with you. We can make pilots safer and we can make them faster. So it's not like we've thought up a new idea here. It's just we take the idea down market.